Hello, and welcome to In the Den. I'm Lisa Vioni, the CEO of Hedge Connection. And today I have my friend and colleague, Warren Fisher with me from Manola Capital. Warren, good to see you, Warren. Good to see you too, Lisa. Now, Warren was spent um, almost 20 years at GSAM. Uh, when he was at GSAM, uh, he was on the growth equity team, managing all the growth assets at GSAM. He also was an analyst for the financial and technology sectors at GSAM. So long before we had the term FinTech, Warren was focusing all of his energy on that space. So I brought Warren here today, um, and I'd like to speak with him about his definition of FinTech, what FinTech is, and how certain areas of FinTech, specifically the payment sector, is being affected by COVID-19. So Warren, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Lisa. So uh, yeah, about 20 years at GSAM, and uh, not only was I a portfolio manager, but a uh, an analyst, uh, first and foremost, on the financial sector and the technology sector. And so for us at, at GSAM, we were uh, not necessarily focused on individual sectors and making sure that our weights matched, uh, say, the Russell 1000 growth or the S&P 500 in terms of sector weights. We were looking for wonderful companies that had certain characteristics that we found attractive. And within financials, um, unfortunately, a lot of banks and insurance companies don't have those characteristics that we look for. They have opaque balance sheets and uh, they're not able to generate recurring revenue or predictable or sustainable revenue. And so we found um, specifically on the financial side, the derivative exchanges were very attractive. And uh, our definition at Manole Capital of FinTech is anything utilizing technology to improve an established process. And maybe I'll go over an example, a quick example of a name that we own back at GSAM that we currently also own at Manole Capital and how that fits into that broad definition that might be a little bit different from the typical FinTech uh, example. So a hundred plus years ago, the the CME, the Chicago Merck, was actually known as the egg and butter exchange. And if you were a farmer in the Midwest and wanted to go ahead and um, lay off some of your egg and butter exposure, you would literally hire someone to go into the pit in an open outcry setting and yell at each other with, with paper and, and trade. And now 90 to 95 percent of the average daily volume that happens on the CME occurs on something called Globex which is an all electronic exchange that's fully scalable. It trades anything from equities to interest rates to energy, uh, net gas and crude, any ag commodity you can think of, uh, FX and metals and gold. So it trades the gamut of asset classes and it's simply a better way to transact. So once again, with our definition, utilizing technology to improve and establish process, a hundred years ago, that process was in the pits in an open outcry setting. And now you utilizing technology and the global platform, the CME kind of fits our definition of fintech. But to your earlier question, um, the payment sector for us is the quintessential fintech business. And we really like to look at a subsegment of the payment space. Um, we don't look at card issuers. Uh, in fact, we're short um, uh, no, numerous card issuers, and that's because we don't like the credit sensitivity and the risk associated with um, with the card issuers. We tend to focus in on the merchant acquirers, the payment processors who are doing the heavy lifting. They're doing the authorization, the clearing, and the settlement of a card transaction, as well as the card networks, names like uh, Visa, MasterCard, or PayPal. Great. Well, Visa, you mentioned Visa, and I know Visa has been a great company, a great investment for uh, many to invest. And I know it's uh, has been a favorite company of yours uh, to invest in at Manole Capital. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about Visa and explain to our viewers how Visa actually works, because we all have one in our pocket, in our wallets, our pocketbooks, and we kind of, you know, maybe take it for granted. Maybe we don't exactly understand the background and how they 
make their money or what part of the money they're making you're you know being able to uh take advantage of so if you could walk us through that um that would be great sure sure so um we have a slide that's available uh on our on our website nolaycapital.com under the research tab we have our presentation and i'll try to share with you uh that slide on your screen just give me one second here it's fairly crude. It's not the, the greatest slide in the world, but it's our version of marketing at Manoli Capital. Can you see that, Lisa? I can see it. Thank you. All right, great. So if uh, you, Rob, and I go out to dinner tonight, um, in a normalized world, we'll be able to go out to dinner again. Um, and I pay for dinner tonight on my Bank of America Visa card. Uh, that restaurant will get $97.50 put into their account if it's a $100 card transaction. So this slide looks at a $100 credit card transaction in the U.S. And you'll see on it that um, on a typical card transaction, there'll be $2.50 in fees that are taken out of that transaction. And they go to three different parties, sometimes four different parties. But I try to simplify it on this slide. So that green part of the pie chart um, is the card issuer. They're going to get about 70% of that $2.50 in merchant discount rate, MDR. So they get $1.75 of that fees. And we typically at Manoli Capital aren't focused at all on the card issuers. Once again, they're the, the companies that have credit sensitivity. They have risk whether or not you give me uh, whether or not you pay your bill back at the end of every month. But we typically uh, focus only on the payment networks, which would be a Visa, MasterCard, uh, PayPal, um, and they might only earn 15 cents, which isn't a lot on a per transaction basis. However, when you look at uh, 15 cents on billions and billions of transactions, it can really add up. We also really like the merchant acquiring and the payment processor space but uh, once again, we do not focus on 70% of the economics of a card transaction. That card issuer model is, is fraught with a lot of risk. It's credit sensitive, and there's a lot of costs associated with that. Not only do they worry about whether or not you pay them back on a monthly basis, but there's costs and expense associated with issuing those points and miles. So you know, once again, we focus just on the predictable, sustainable, recurring revenue aspect of, of a card transaction and and try to stay away from the credit, the cyclical nature of that card issuer business. Great. Now, Warren, I, you know, we've, we, we I mentioned Visa before and um, I have a Visa card in my pocketbook and I know I'm sure you have one in your wallet. Um, could you talk a little bit to the viewers about what we're really holding in our wallet, what, what that card actually represents? Yeah, so uh, Visa or MasterCard actually doesn't even know who you and I are. Um, they can identify us as that 16-digit code that is across the front of that piece of plastic in your, in your leather wallet. But what you have with a credit card um, or a debit card is a relationship with a funding agent or a bank. And so you have a line of credit, whether it's with J.P. Morgan Chase, it could be with Citi, with Wells Fargo, with Bank of America, or or a credit union or a, a community bank in your network, in your, in your neighborhood. But Visa and MasterCard are not the one that has that relationship with you. It's actually interesting, Jamie Diamond at, at JP Morgan has been trying to get the Visa and the MasterCard bug on the front right-hand portion of your card put onto the back of your card. He's really trying to emphasize that that card in your wallet is a JP Morgan Chase card, not a Visa card. And so it's very important to understand where you are in the payment cycle. And once again, we stay away from the card issuers and that's not something new just because of COVID-19 or because of the environment that we're currently in with 30 million Americans that unfortunately have lost their job. Um, we're gonna see what happens with defaults and delinquencies as they skyrocket here. But we have always avoided that space. And we wrote a note about two years ago um, using one of our favorite, uh, our mentors in a way, uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, we used one of his great quotes, you find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. 
And we used that as a title for our research note about two years ago, talking how we really don't like the card issuing space. Uh, long before COVID-19 was on anyone's uh, mind, uh, we just said, you know, we're not comfortable with the risk associated with owning a card issuer. And certainly in this environment, uh, with COVID-19, with a sheltering in place environment, you really don't want to own uh, the card issuers. We feel that it's a, a dangerous place to be. And we tend to focus on secular growing businesses, not the cyclical nature of the card issuing business. Right. And, you know, the other thing that I find interesting about when I talk to you about fintech and what you're investing in, you don't invest in any of the FANG stocks. Correct. Is that still the case? And so, that's, can, that's can so that us normal people over here, just we think about fang, the FANG stocks and bucket that into fintech. Yeah, so if you really break apart fintech into a couple of different pieces, within financials, um, you can buy the XLF, which is an ETF for, for financials, and you're going to own um, a lot of big banks and insurance companies, and we own no uh, banks or insurance companies, uh, frankly, nothing that's cyclical in nature, nothing that you would call traditional financials. And if you want that kind of exposure, you can buy that XLF. I want to say it's five or eight basis points, uh, fairly cost efficient to buy, and you can get that exposure. Um, we're not focused at all on traditional financials. And then to your question, we are no Facebook, no Amazon, no Apple, no Netflix, no Google, no Microsoft, none of your traditional technology names. And once again, if you want that exposure, you can buy the XLK. Um, and for that, call it five basis points uh, of cost, you're gonna get a great portfolio of technology names, uh, many of those fame names that you're talking about, but that's not really our niche. Um, so, you know, once again, when we look at payment companies, for us, payment companies are the quintessential fintech business. And is a payment company a financial because they help move money from, in that example we talked about, from the restaurant to their bank account, out of my, you know, Chase account um, to pay for that? Is it a financial because it's moving money? Or is Visa or MasterCard or the payment processors? Are they tech companies? Visa can do 65,000 transactions a second. So is it a tech company? Is it a financial company? We don't really get caught up in its sector classification. Once again, we're looking for wonderful companies that have certain characteristics. Those characteristics can be dominant market share, um, you know, secular growth opportunities, that business models that are predictable, sustainable, that generate recurring revenue, companies that just generate tons and tons of free cash flow that have fortress balance sheets, uh, dominant market share. And so we are looking for management teams that are going to rationally allocate capital. And so for us, Visa and MasterCard and maybe many of the payment names fit under our definition of fintech. But, um, you know, it's not your traditional tech and it's not your traditional financials. It's really a hybrid and it's a niche that we tend to focus on. Okay, there's one more name that I want, I would love for you to talk a little sure. bit about with us. It's a name that maybe many are not familiar with, um, but I, I I know the name and I've um, read a little bit about this payment company called Stripe and they're not yet public, um, but I, I know they've grown tremendously and I know you know a lot about that company. Um, I would love for you to share a little bit about Stripe. Sure, so there are um, roughly three dominant uh, what's called a payment gateway. And um, the three dominant ones, at least in the market today, uh, two of them are public and one is private. Um, in our hedge fund, we actually own all three. Uh, Stripe is one of the largest holdings in our hedge fund and we can own private companies in our hedge fund. Um, but the other two, uh, one is uh, called Braintree, which is owned by PayPal. And the other is Adyen, which is a Netherlands based company. Uh, that went public uh, about a year and a half ago. And they really are helping companies switch and migrate from being just a physical merchant um, and helping them get online. And one of the things we've seen is the rapid and steady growth, that predictable growth of e-commerce. 
So if you were to go back 20 years ago, um, here in the US, of total US retail sales, e-commerce represented less than 1%. It was actually 0.8% going back to 2000. And then if you were to look at 2010, so 10 years later, e-commerce represented 4.5% of total retail sales. And then fast forward all the way to 2019, and it steadily improved to 11%. Well, in this environment, in a shelter and home environment, where most people are shopping online, um, you're going to see that number dramatically increase. But we know for a fact, things are just steadily moving online. They're migrating from physical sales to online sales and e-commerce is growing and growing. And so those three companies, Stripe um, in particular, continues to capture and help companies um, adopt an e-commerce presence and allow them to take uh, electronic forms of payment, whether it's a credit card, a debit card, or, or even a, um, a digital transaction. And so those are the three companies that dominate the, the payment gateway space. And uh, you know we own all three. Excellent. And, um, you know, Stripe, I think somehow I remember reading that they are uh, somehow they, they work with Amazon or are they the, the payment processor right. for Amazon? Right. So I, I they help a lot of. Yes. Yeah, so certainly now they, they do. It's either Uber or Lyft. I think it's Uber. Um, they handle the payment for Uber as well. But one of their largest clients is Amazon. And certainly in this environment, we know that Amazon is absolutely killing it. They are um, the, the preferred way to shop right now. And uh, Stripe does help Amazon accept payments. Um, and they help tons and tons of other companies. Last week, when they raised some money in the, in the market, Stripe announced that they landed Zoom as well. So we know um, we're not using Zoom right now, but certainly, uh, millions of other people are using Zoom, and some are using the free version, some are using the professional version, and uh, their Stripe is handling uh, Zoom transactions as well. Well, it seems like they would be a candidate to IPO when maybe the markets free up a bit um, post-COVID. Yeah, so they we'll they might. Uh, the Collison brothers run it. Uh, they with their raising uh, some money last week. Uh, they have $2 billion in cash in the bank. Uh, they have a ton of opportunities in front of them, helping companies embrace e-commerce and online transactions. Um, they're one of the three dominant players. And, uh, you know, they could go public. Uh, certainly right now, this is not a time uh, that the capital markets are open. I don't envision we're going to see a lot of IPOs in the next month or two or three. Um, but it, it kind of goes back to a point of you want to be with and investing in companies that have fortress balance sheets, because you never really know when uh, the environment is going to slow and slam down on, on capital. And companies that are in desperate need of, of capital right now are simply not going to be able to access it. If you're not generating great free cash flow, um, you're in trouble right now. There was a great quote from uh, Jamie Dimon on uh, the first quarter JP Morgan call. And he said, entering a crisis is, is not a time when you want to figure out who and what you want to be. And, uh, you know, we talk a little bit about this in our, in our recent newsletter um, that we just put out last week. Um, but you can prepare for this kind of environment. You certainly aren't going to be able to predict it. And we absolutely did not predict a COVID-19 environment, but you want to be prepared for it. And we feel like with our scenario modeling and our testing and our ownership of companies that have great free cash flow and have fortress balance sheets, that um, we're well equipped to handle this storm and weather this storm that we're currently in. And when we come out of this and things return to a more normalized environment, we really feel like our companies are going to be the winners. And uh, we certainly don't want to be invested in companies that are going to be struggling to access capital or don't generate free cash flow. Yeah, good point. Well, Warren, this has been a great conversation. And I would 
like to ask you one question before we have to leave our viewers. Sure. Is there anything that you want to leave them with before we have to say goodbye? Yeah, so um, I just referenced our, our second quarter investor newsletter. And, um, you know, typically in our newsletters, we'll talk about We'll talk about um, kind of macro issues, the interest rates, inflation, Fed activity. Uh, last year, it was filled with kind of U.S. versus China and the trade war. No one seems to be talking about that right now because we're very much in a COVID environment. But in our most recent newsletter, um, we did talk about how COVID-19 is impacting the fintech space. And maybe I'll just leave you with a couple of examples that I think are are really going to spur um, activity towards electronic payments. So, give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, the the World Health Organization as well as the CDC uh, did a study back in 2017, and it found, and this is kind of gross, on uh, it tested all of these paper currencies, U.S. dollars, in New York City, and it found that over uh, just shy of 400 different kind of bacteria were living on our paper currency. And so um, no one really wants to touch paper currency. And now in a COVID environment, absolutely no one wants to touch it. People want to go towards contactless payments using your mobile phone right here to go ahead and transact. And the WHO has actually said it's advocating or pushing people to transact with their phone, mobile-based payments, as well as um, card um, and staying away from cash. And there's just a couple of examples that I, I go and, and mention in our newsletter. So I'm a big Chick-fil-A guy, uh, love their chicken sandwiches. And uh, a lot of Chick-fil-A's uh, around the United States are no longer accepting cash. Um, if you go and we get back to an environment in your neck of the woods in New York City, on the 456 line, which runs along the uh, east side of New York City, last year the MTA installed, I'm sure you saw it, um, these digital um, uh, ways to, instead of using your Metro card, you can use a card for contactless payment, or you can use your phone uh, to access the subway. And it was so wildly successful last year that the MTA is rolling it out to all the subways, all the buses. Um, and so you'll see that when we get back to a more normalized environment, that will you know, show good growth. In New York City, just last month, um, also not related to COVID, um, the 80,000 parking spots in New York City will no longer be just insert a quarter, insert a quarter, and keep on feeding the turnstile. Um, they're moving to a mobile-based app. And so we're seeing a lot of, a lot of businesses. I, I have a client who emailed me, texted me yesterday. He lives in Chicago during the summer. And he said the Whole Foods in Chicago is no longer accepting cash. They're forcing customers to pay with their phone or with a card. And so we're just going to slowly see this um, embrace of digital forms of payment, whether it's a mobile phone, contactless, on, on a card. And we actually think this is a, a positive coming out of COVID-19 to take away market share from cash. And cash is really the market share donor in this space. In the U.S., if you were to go back to 2016, 31% of payment transactions were done in cash. And then in 2017, it went down to 30%. In 2018, it went down to 26%. I'm sure last year in 2019, it was under a quarter. And in, certainly in this environment, it's going to continue to go down and down. So I guess the one big takeaway is um, if there's anyone we're gaining market share with a lot of our payment companies, we continue to steal market share from cash. It's the, the, sleepy, the sleepy market share donor, at least for us. Yeah, great. Well, yeah, I think it's been amazing to me to watch how we're all adapting very quickly because of COVID-19 and things are happening that maybe would have taken a couple of years or happening now in a couple of months. And to your point, with going cashless. It sounds like that we're going to adopt that very quickly. And when we get out of COVID-19, that, that could be the new reality. So I guess we'll see what happens. Well, that, that's, that's the hope. That's the hope. We, we, uh, we certainly don't want COVID-19 to force people to act, transact this way, 
But if it's a natural benefit for all involved, whether it's the merchant, the consumer, um, it's a positive that can come out of this. Absolutely. Well, Warren, thank you so much for your time and sharing your insights with our viewers. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, stay I'm well. happy to be on, Lisa. Best to Rob and to you and stay safe out there. Thank you. You too. And you and your family stay well and we'll talk soon. Thanks again, Bye -bye. Lisa. Bye now.